Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at prediction accuracy metrics, measures that look at how correct or incorrect, maybe even how far off, a recommender system is in predicting what a person would have rated an item. So our goals for today are to understand how to compute three of the common prediction accuracy metrics, mean absolute error, mean squared error, and root mean squared error. That middle one, mean squared error, is not commonly used, but it's useful to understand as a, a path towards root mean squared error. Understand variations on how these can be computed, and understand where this type of metric is useful and the comparisons among these, ver these versions of the accuracy metric. So let's start with a little intuition. Error metrics tend to be thought of as intuitively a leave one out approach to understanding how a recommender would work. So I have this wonderful recommender system running. I may have hundreds of thousands of users, I may have you know, tens of thousands of items, millions of ratings, it's churning along and I say, wait a minute, how good is this thing at predicting what these people are rating? And I would go through a set of ratings, maybe all of them, maybe a, a, just a set of a certain size and say, if I didn't have this rating in the system, let's take it out and ask the system to predict what that user would think of this item and see how close we are. Oh, off by 0.3, that's not bad. Let's do that with another item and another item. Now, as it turns out, for many algorithms, this is hard. It's hard to take a piece of data out. So in many cases, evaluations work with shortcuts. They may say, we'll take 10% out and predict that 10%, then we'll take another 10% out and we can repeat this to get confidence in our measure. But whatever form we're doing, we take data that we already have and we see how well we could have generated that data in the absence of having that. This is fundamentally a dead data technique. It's retrospective. We're not looking forward, although one could theoretically say we're going to measure when people rate in the future will capture what we would have predicted. What we can never do with this kind of technique is say how good are the predictions we gave to items the user has chosen never to consume because we just don't know what they think about those items. So mean absolute error is probably the simplest measure here. It defines error as the divergence of prediction from actual rating. So the prediction minus the rating is the error. We get rid of the sign plus or minus by saying P minus R, we're going to take the absolute value. And the reason we do this is because two wrongs don't make a right. We don't want to say we have a very accurate uh, recommender because half the time it's two stars high and half the time it's two stars low, so on average it's perfect. On average it's off by two stars, we just, the direction is a separate issue. And the way we take the mean of those absolute errors is to say, for every rating, let's start there, let's sum up the absolute value of prediction minus rating and divide that by the total number of ratings. So simple measure. Mean squared error, instead of taking the absolute value, squares the error. And there's two reasons to do this. One is it's another way to get rid of the sign. You know, minus one and one squared both have the same value or minus two and two squared have the same value. But more important, this comes from a belief that large errors are more important than small errors. That if I'm off by half a star four times, that's not as big as being off by two stars, even once. And so if we want to avoid that, just to run through the math, if I took half a star squared, I'd get a quarter star. If I do that four times, I have a quarter star times four. The average there is a quarter star off. If I take two stars and I'm off and three ratings where I'm perfect, I would get two 
plus zero, zero, and zero. And that would be measured twice as bad in mean squared error than having four of them, all of them off by a quarter star. Now, there is a disadvantage here. Talking about how big your squared error is, is not on an intuitive scale. If I told you that we, we can predict your number of stars that you uh, are correct, are, are predicting a movie for, and we have a squared error of 1.7 stars, most people don't go into their head and say, now wait a minute, what's the square root of 1.7 or of 0.8 or something like that and compute, oh, that's how many stars off you are in average. And that's the reason people introduced root mean squared error, which just takes the same measurement but puts a square root around it. It still penalizes large errors more than small. It still gets rid of um, the sign effects. But by taking the square root, we're back on a scale where if you tell me that square root is 1.3 stars, I can say, oh, if my error is 1.3 stars, I'm only on a five-star scale that's not a lot of confidence. You know, the difference between four and four and a half is just not that likely to be reliable. And thus I have three measures. Now we glossed over something here. I said that the, we could just add up for every rating the error and divide by the number of ratings, and that is the usual model. But there are alternative models. The most common one is to say, we're going to look at the error that each user faces and tell you the average error for each user or a distribution of errors for each user. And in that case, I would average the users first. And if a user had 10 ratings, I'll divide by 10. And if a user had 3,000, I'll add the all up the errors and divide by 3,000 and then average those averages together. It's not a very pure mathematical thing but it gives you a view of per person what's the likely effect. And a distribution of per user errors can be quite meaningful. There are a few rare cases where you might care about per item error. If you're in the business where pushing items to the right people is what really matters more than thinking about people, you might average your errors over items, look at the distribution, and then take an average of that. And our advice to you is consider looking at all of these that are relevant for your situation. Understand that averaging over ratings is what's normal for most comparative purposes. If you see most published results, they'll have that. But you can use um, different averages if you have a reason that they relate to what you want to measure for your system. Uh, the other thing to do is what do you do when you're comparing MAE for different cases? different algorithms, for instance, because you want the same data set in the same scale. Now, there's always going to be issues, even if you have the same data set in the same scale, that some algorithms don't produce a recommendation or a prediction value in this case for every item. There are ones that say, I don't have enough data. And what are you going to do about that? And there's two possible ways of dealing with that. One of them is to say we're going to treat each uh, algorithm in its best case. We're going to look at only the common subset of item uh, user pairs of ratings for which we can generate predictions by every algorithm, including the ones that cherry pick the best or the easiest to compute. And in that case, we can look at the algorithms comparatively by looking at their MAE or RMSE only over the items that they all make predictions for. That's a way of saying at their best how good are these algorithms. Let's let them cherry pick. It's not commonly used though. A more common alternative that I think makes a lot more sense is to say that in the real world we've got to come up with some way to give this thing a score. And what we'll do is we'll have a baseline that we fall back to if the algorithm punts. The algorithm says, I have no idea what you are going to think about this. We fall back to a sensible baseline. Um, 
That baseline could simply be a non-personalized score, like the overall average. Uh, more commonly, what we'll do is a weighted score and say we're going to use the overall average and the user average and combine those in a weighted way to say, well, we understand if we normalize ratings over all items, how good is this compared to other items? We understand your scale, we'll map it to your scale. And so we'll give you a semi-personalized score where the scaling at least is personalized, even if the recommendation is based on overall averages. And if your algorithm can't make a prediction, we'll substitute that prediction for it. You'll see this when we come to some of the exercises that this is a common approach that we often want to use in these cases. It allows us to put all the algorithms on an even footing in an environment where we really do care about predictions. So, a couple quick things. All of these error metrics are highly correlated. Other people have done the studies already. They've plotted lots of graphs. If you have a case where an algorithm is much better than another one by MAE, it's probably better by RMSE. And in general, if you pick one measure like this, it's going to be good for anything. The squared could uh, catch large errors that happen occasionally, but there are other measures we're going to talk about in the next lecture that deal with that better. Uh, both MAE and RMSE have lots of public data sets with public results on algorithms, so it's easier to do comparisons there. Uh, the drawback is that error as a measure is often dominated by the irrelevant parts of your product space. If you're very good at identifying the top 50 candidates for somebody and precisely targeting them, but you just don't know how much people like or dislike the bad stuff, error is going to kill your measure. This is the problem we've often talked about in the Netflix challenge, that if all you really care about is, can I find 100 things for somebody, how accurately you can predict number 4,000 may just not matter. And so if that doesn't matter, you should be looking at some other kinds of metrics, of which we'll have several of them in the upcoming lectures.